Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're going to begin in verse 3. And uh, we're going to read verses 3 through 8 this morning. As we continue our series in the book of Romans, we're going to finish the book of Romans this fall, Lord willing, be done by Christmas time. Uh, but this is an incredibly important passage for us to consider about how you individually fit into the work of God. Answering partly the question I even asked Steve this morning, let's just read together for a moment Romans 12, 3 through 8, and then we're going to concentrate on understanding it today. It says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Father, we ask that you would bless with power the reading of your word, the study of it, these moments where we have to gather before you and be shaped by your word in our life. We ask that you would go way beyond just helping us to understand it with our minds, but to be filled with a joy in obeying it, an insight into our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think it is lost on us how interconnected we are to one another. You know, we may look around society and complain about how many things can be wrong and problems there are to solve. And feel the burden of that. But, but, you know, so many things happen day after day that, that are the result of someone else's contribution to our lives. And, and, and it's so good, actually, that it ought to cause us to be more grateful and less individualistic. You know, I woke up this morning and there was electricity that came out of the outlets to charge my computer. I mean, have you ever just been shocked? I know nothing about le electricity and how it's made. I feel like I should be more educated, but I'm not an electrician. If it broke, I couldn't fix it. But there was electricity there. And before that, I had water come out of the spigot uh, at the sink, and I was able to pour it into my coffee machine. You know, without that coffee for the last 30 years of my life, I don't know how I could have functioned. Anybody? Can I get an amen from anybody? Thank you, my coffee drinkers out there. You know, but yesterday when I was out of coffee beans, I went to the store and lo and behold, several months ago, someone in Ethiopia apparently had harvested green coffee beans from a single source, it said on the bag, there and made sure that those beans got to the roaster and those beans got roasted and it got on a ship or a plane. I still have no idea. Somebody learned how to fly a plane across the sea. A truck driver showed up to work and drove it to Lidl. If you're wondering where I buy my coffee, I buy it at Lidl. We don't really think about the fact that our lives, honestly, our lives are a miracle of interrelated contribution from other people. We don't think about it until something goes wrong, like a run on toilet paper that cleans out all of the stores. You guys remember that, or was that too long ago? The decisions you make, the decisions I make, whether we can go to work or not, I mean, all of those things play into this delicate balance that makes up the forgotten things in our lives. Because we are incredibly interconnected. Well, in this passage, you know, we find that the gospel 
produces a community of interdependent grace. It produces uh, in us a recognition of that connectedness that, that we aren't to live as sort of rugged individuals like many people in, outside of here might think of themselves. And maybe you came in thinking, we're not to think of ourselves as rugged individuals, but part of an interconnected body that is a part of God's grace, His unmerited favor on our lives that allows us to carry out His will and glorify Him. You see, what we find is that all as we look about our lives, that in many ways, the, the sort of uh, connections in society, the connections in our relationship break down, and we bemoan the fact that, that often society doesn't work in the way that we would like it to, but we, uh, but we realize that God has called us in the church to be able to exhibit a sense of real community in our mission before Him, real community in our lives that helps us glorify God with one another, the gospel of of Jesus when we get it it doesn't just save us individually it produces a community that we are a part of of interdependent grace the word grace is used twice in the passage to remind us that we're recipients of unmerited undeserved blessing and provision and favor from God and that God intends for us in the gospel to be a part of a family that has contributed to our lives. Biblical community, this set of relationships in the church, is built to make us live with a genuine awareness that we have been given this undeserved favor by God through the service of others. And through His special distribution of kindness toward us. And because of that, we are called in the same way to offer ourselves to others and make our contribution to them as an act of worship. Last week in Romans 12, 1 and 2, we saw that we are to present our bodies to God as an act of worship. And it, it isn't lost on me that right after that, the way that we present our bodies to God is actually by presenting them to one another in service. So that God can use us to glorify Him together. And so today the text calls us to a greater awareness, a new way of thinking. In fact, it uses the word thinking four times in the first verse or two. A new way of thinking about God's undeserved favor in our life so that we can build a community together here at Pillar that glorifies God and accomplishes His will. And unless we embrace this new way of thinking about who we are, how we belong together, and how we function, we will fail to fulfill the, the will that God has for us to accomplish and really glorify God the way that we can if we present ourselves to Him and we remain connected to one another. Three particular ways I see it at work in this passage Three things that will be required of us if we are going to live in this sense of community with one another. And I want to take us through them this morning. The first thing we see is that biblical community, this kind of relationship in the body, requires us to resist inflation. Biblical community requires us to resist inflation. As, you know, inflation is a big topic right now, right? As many of you may know, Annie and I spent a few weeks in Argentina earlier this year. And uh, over the years, I've found when, whenever I travel to other countries and, and to other places, usually the best plan financially is just to grab a decent Visa credit card. Uh, it's as good as anything else to get money added with the occasional pull of cash from the ATM. And you don't have to think hard about what you're going to do to you know, pack money in your sock you know, as you're traveling overseas. And so I prefer to travel light, not carry a lot of cash. And I thought, that's exactly uh, what I'm going to do. And while I was on the plane, I met a guy from Buenos Aires who, uh, who asked me what I was planning to do to exchange dollars for Argentine pesos. And I told him my plan. I was like, no problem. Just when I get there, I'm going to go find an ATM or a bank. I'm do a little uh, draw some of that out of there and what I normally do. And for the rest of my purchases, I'll probably just use my credit card. After telling me I needed to pay attention a little more <laughs> to financial markets, uh, he was very kind about it, but he was like, you should pay more attention when you travel. He explained that in Argentina, the central government 
had insisted on inflating the value of the peso in Argentina, and, and the central government had one exchange rate that it enforced on all the formal banks and official institutions, and they had to use that exchange rate, but that everyone else around knew that it wasn't worth that much. <laughs> And the exchange uh, for U.S. dollars and euros uh, kind of in society at whole was at an entirely different rate. Interestingly enough, if you get money from an ATM in Argentina, one dollar at the time was equal to a hundred pesos. Pretty simple, you can do the math, right? One dollar, a hundred pesos. But if you send it to yourself through Western Union, it was one dollar to two hundred pesos. I mean, that's a big difference, right? That's like a 50% off coupon everywhere you go. And he's like, so I don't know what you're planning to do, but I would go Western Union if I were you. So I did that. I checked on it still today, and the bank rate insists that the peso is worth twice as much as everyone else out in the real world knows it's worth. It's like this insistence by the government to keep it propped up and inflate the value of the currency. And in a sense, this is what Paul is warning us against as he begins to talk about biblical community here. In a sense, this is what he's warning us. Some of us have a government rate assessment of our skills, ability, and character, while everyone else around us recognizes the Western Union rate. Now, this isn't about your worth before God or your value. But it is about who you are in your character, your development, your maturity, your skills, your abilities. And he says, you know, if you're not careful, you're going to go with the government rate when you look at yourself. And you're going to wonder why everyone else around you is dealing with you in the way that they all sort of recognize is true. This is what he, he just says it clearly then. Here in the passage. He said, you know, he shows us that nothing ruins a sense of community more than when we carry an overinflated sense of value of our contribution. And so he says it clearly, if we're going to be a community of interdependent grace, the first thing that happens and needs to happen in our life, we need to hear Paul when he says, we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Like, just go ahead and accept the Western Union rate about who you are and carry yourself that way and see how it changes the dynamics of your relationship when you carry that kind of sober judgment and humility with others. You'll find that people are more responsive when you have sober judgment and assessment of who you are, of your strengths, of your weaknesses, of what you have to contribute Be reasonable or people are going to have to create some weird system around you to deal with the fact that you insist on being treated like you're elite. You know, that's kind of what happened in Argentina. They built a system to work around what they already knew wasn't the case. This happens in relationships when we carry ourselves with pride and other people are having to step around us and sort of handle us in a way that says, I don't think he realizes some of his weaknesses. We're encouraged not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, but to use sober judgment so that it positions us to relate to one another with a genuine, genuine, sincere sense of humility. That builds biblical community. You can get a lot done when together we're not insisting on being honored, (laughs) but fine with being servants. And so he says we're to use sober judgment. Well, here's what it sounds like in relationships when you don't do that. They should have paid more attention to me at that place. Nobody paid attention to me. I'm kind of a big deal. I can't believe they didn't ask me to lead that ministry. I shared an idea. Nobody did anything to make it happen. Might not have been that great of an idea, right? I could, I could serve in that role as good as that person. Isn't there someone else who could do this task so I can get on to something more important? All right. Some of y'all got real quiet. You guys are, you were a little more responsive when I was being funny. (laughs) The people I'm serving with are not the kind of people I'd hang out with. 
You can think of your own examples, I'm sure, of what it sounds like to think more highly than you ought to think. But it's a real issue. The gospel reminds us that we do not belong to the body of Christ because of our great achievements or skills. Listen, let's, let's be clear. In the kingdom of God, we are a net loss to bring into this relationship. <laughs> God brought us into this relationship at a net loss through the price of his son. <laughs> we are here. If you're a Christian and you belong to the body of Christ, Jesus, who was of infinite worth, paid the price to redeem you from your sin and to bring you into a relationship with his father and place you in a body with other Christians. We are a net loss, but God rejoices to have us. <laughs> And so he says, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. If we're going to build real community, we will need to let that adjust us so that we use sober judgment. We've got to resist inflation. Second thing we see is biblical community requires us to recognize God's distribution. To recognize God's dis distribution. We see it here at the end of verse 3 by reminding us that the measure of faith that we have comes from God. God is the source of our spiritual life. He is the one who's made us spiritually alive. He is the one who has given us vitality and sanctification and growth and maturity. He's been doing the work to bring that along. And he's the one who has shaped all of the details and circumstances of our life. There is sort of a measure that has been given to us. So we're to recognize, he says, God's contribution. In the text we see it here, when it comes to our contribution to God's kingdom and life inside the church, we are told something interesting there at the end of verse 3, that God is the unique distributor of your gifts, your situation, and your assignment. The assignments that you have in life, the challenges you face, the skill sets you've God, the circumstances you've faced, they have been uniquely designed and purposed by God. He is the distributor. Maybe you saw this phrase, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned you, and scratched your head a little bit. Anybody else do that? You're like, eh, I mean, I don't know. That kind of gets me as a little uncomfortable. Anybody else? Can I get a few people like, this is not fair. You're telling me that God gave, you know, that God gave Annie eight faith? And gave me four. And so it's a lot easier for her to exercise her Christian life because she got eight. It's no fair. I find it hard to do certain things that maybe she does well. And we think immediately when we see this measure of faith language, we, we begin to quantify it because that's how we work, right? That this, the only explanation here is it's just saying there's more or less quantity doled out of this general idea of faith. So we love to size one other up and look at it and go, some people get more faith. And we look around and we can, we can test against it and we're just like, how unfair of God. But in the context here, what is he actually talking about? Well, in the context, it means that God has given each of our lives a bunch of unique features and he gives faith for you to fulfill what he has called you to. In the uniqueness of your own situation. That he has measured out the faith necessary for you to fulfill your callings, not someone else's. And so we serve and relate to one another in the body of Christ according to the measure of faith that God has assigned to our situation that is required for us to be faithful. And maybe there's something in your life that you look and you go, I don't know if I can do that. I would rather have that person's assignment. I would find it really easy to be a faithful Christian if I could play that person's role or I had that person's background or that person's resources. And you look around and you, just, and you discount the fact that God has given the measure of faith for you to fulfill your calling personally. And that we're to entrust ourselves to God to complete His assignment for us. Listen, this means, what, what he's talking about here is God measures a faith according to assignment. It means that God has given each of our lives 
each one of you, if you're in this room today, and, and particularly, listen, if you are a Christian who has professed faith in Christ, who has bowed down to his lordship and considers them someone who, himself someone who is following Jesus, God has given each of our lives a unique background that no one else in this room has experienced. A unique set of circumstances right now that you face. Unique giftings and skills and abilities. Unique levels of development of character in different areas. That are all of these things are intended to be used for us to make a unique contribution to his kingdom. So he isn't talking here flatly about faith in general. He's talking about the diversity of our backgrounds, circumstances, experience, and skills. Together, all of these put us in a unique position to make a contribution that God has assigned particularly to us and will require faith for us to accomplish. It'll require faith today for you to accomplish what God has assigned you to be faithful to. In some unique way, God has things that you're to do, responsibilities that he has assigned to you, vision that you can see in terms of needs in the body, in the community, in other people's lives, that, that God has given you the ability to recognize. And he comes along and he grants the measure of faith necessary for you to step in what, to what he's called you to, not for you to perform somebody else's task. So if we're going to receive that assignment, exercise, walk in it as an act of faith, we need to see all the ways that our unique role and place in life have been shaped by God and respond to him in trust as we pursue our callings. When God saved you, he also, you know, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 10 says that he prepared good works for you to walk in beforehand. He had a purpose and an intention for your life to glorify him as an act of worship like we read in uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. A unique way. And I can't go incredibly deep in this today, but let me give you a couple of questions you could ask yourself to begin to see your assignments in God's mission. Here's the first question. What, what is unique about my background that gives me a different perspective than others might have in the body of Christ? I just realized I didn't put these questions up on the screen. I really should have. Uh, but I'm going to say them twice so that you can catch them. Some of you note takers are like writing real fast. You're afraid I'm going to move on quick. But listen, what is, the unique, what is unique about my background that gives me a different perspective than others might have in the body of Christ? All of you have, I, mean, I know so many of your stories. And it's so unique to be able to see things from a particular perspective. Those are God-given circumstances. What, second question, what is unique about my current circumstances that limits or positions me for a particular focus in serving God and glorifying God? Right now, you know, if you went, went around in this room, there's, there's all kinds of things going on in your lives that, that particularly limit. <laughs> there's circumstances that, that dictate what you can do right now, what, what it looks like for you to be faithful to God. Might have you here for a particular time, or, you know, so many of you might, might look and go, you know, I, I'm just here for eight more months while I finish a school. What can I do? Well, that's a unique circumstance. It creates a unique opportunity for focus and knowing you don't have all kinds of time to make an impact here, whether it's through this church or in this community, and that God may have put you in a unique situation somewhere in the neighborhood that you live in, the coworkers you're going to be with for the next eight months, that, that those things are a particular set of circumstances and limits that God has ordained and purposed for you. Start to ask that question. What is unique about my current circumstances that limits or positions the focus of my ministry? Some of you go, you know, I'm a mom. I, I feel like all of my time is given to caring for a baby or for uh, preschool children. And I, I don't know what I can do to serve the Lord. But right there, in the middle of those unique circumstances, God has a purpose. Not beyond them, not, not apart from them, but through them, in them. 
the second question. Third question, what sort of things am I really good at and confident to do? What sort of things am I really good at and confident to do? You know, special training, natural giftedness. Some of you just have natural types of gifts at organizing people or helping others feel inspired to do a task. Some of you are bold evangelists. Some of you are great teachers, and, and, and there's all sorts of things that you might be gifted to do. Some of you have merciful, compassionate hearts for people in need, and, and, and those, those things are skill sets and desires and longings and abilities that you have that are important and help you figure out what your contribution is. Number four, when do I feel most energized in serving others? Or sense the Holy Spirit's power. You know, there's some things you do in life that all of a sudden you 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 get a sense like this is what I was made for. (laughs) This is what I was called to do. This is what I'm really good at. This is what I get energized when I serve this way or I or I engage in this thing or do this activity. And maybe you've been spiritually mature enough to be able to recognize a sense of the Holy Spirit's anointing or power in certain circumstances in your life as you've engaged in ministry. But as you engage in serving, you will often experience an energizing from the Lord and from the Spirit that helps you see your giftings. When do I feel most energized in serving others or sense the Holy Spirit's power? Question number five, what am I eager to learn so I can better contribute to the lives of others? You may be in a time in your life where you're like really hungry to learn certain things and it's because God is shaping your calling. He is preparing you for the good works that he has planned beforehand that are a part of your unique gifting. Biblical community requires us to receive This portion that God has assigned to us is uniquely ours to fulfill. Third thing, the problem with uniqueness is that it can turn into prideful individualism. What happens in churches uh, so often, and this is true of any organization, when we discover our particular skills and abilities, that always becomes the most important thing. (laughs) We think of it that way, right? You know, the, the, the old saying... To a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And if you've got a particular skill set or sense of gifting, everything you think is wrong with your organization, everything that you think is wrong with the community that you are part of, everything that you think is wrong with the church, probably revolves around this passion and desire that you wish that other people were more motivated about. And we come to see ourselves as individuals instead of parts of a whole where other people have giftings. But biblical community requires us to realize we are connected to other people who are different than us. We are connected to other people who have giftings that are different because God's work is so variegated. It's so varied in life that there are so many giftings that are necessary for it to really be powerful and activated. Our community has so many different needs. That one type of gifting would never help us reach our community. One type of gifting would never help us become a mature church. But together, when we allow other people to flourish in their giftings and we flourish in ours, we come to understand that biblical community requires us to realize we are connected. It reminds us that we are served by others. The argument in the text, this is one that is Most obvious in verse 4. For as in one body we have many members. And the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. And individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, he says. It's not a hard analogy, is it? It's not hard to understand. We understand a body It's simple and clear, but let's just slow down and think about it for a second, even though it's probably not new to you to think about the church as a body. The church, he says, is the body of Christ. In Christ, we are 
one body, and that body has many members or parts. He is saying that just like the human body can be described as a vast number of individual parts that make up a unified whole to act in the world, the church is one body in Christ that is made up of a diversity of members that require connection with one another to effectively act out the will of Christ in the world. We have to be connected to one another to fulfill what the body was designed to accomplish. I mean, this is, otherwise what we experience is paralysis. What's paralysis? Well, in the body, paralysis occurs when the connection between parts of the body are interrupted by some kind of nervous system failure and the parts become inoperable. Right? We're all familiar with that. A disconnect occurs. I mean, think about it. You can have, you can have an otherwise sharp mind and no real way to act with certain parts of the body, which renders then both the mind and the other body parts less operable. <laughs> you know, it's not just like the sharp mind is finding it no longer can be used for what its purpose is when it's disconnected from the body parts. And likewise, the, 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 the body parts, our hands and our fingers, can't be used when there's a disconnection from the mind through the nervous system. Which do you need more, a sound mind or functional body parts? Let you think about that for a second. Some of you think you have an answer? <laughs> it's kind of a foolish question. The absence of a connection between the two severely inhibits the individual function of both, doesn't it? In the same way, the engagement of one another with various giftings in the body of Christ is completely necessary to enhance all of our ability to accomplish God's will together. And listen, I'm not talking about just sort of our corporate will of a church or the vision that we have particular as Pillar Church, although it's necessary for that. I'm talking about our ability to serve God in His kingdom, to live our lives in a way that is in accordance with His will, is affected by the contribution of other people in this room it's it, there, there, in one way it's interesting I can think about how I see this in my uh, my own life in my own role in this body it, you know if I if I preach and I do a half decent job preaching what is the, really the goal of that it, the goal is that in some way it activates us as a people to embrace the mission that God has for us and go out and do things. But if I preach and there's a disconnect between you and me and what we actually do when we leave, what good is the preaching? I could be known as a great preacher. I could have great oratory skills and interesting illustrations. And to what effect? I'm totally dependent on you for fulfilling the mission God's given to me. And in some way, on the other respect, you depend on others like me who play a role in the body to preach and teach, to be able to have a clear sense of vision and direction about how you can exercise it out. But you don't just depend on me. You depend on other people who are around you, who pray you through difficult seasons, who use their gifts of mercy when you're in pain. And without those things, not only are we diminished as people, but our ability to offer worship to God, to glorify Him and accomplish His mission, is diminished. You see, we have to be connected. Let's just, let's just imagine someone for a moment who's impacted our, by, by our church. They come to faith here. They grow significantly, and God is glorified through their life. Who should they thank, <laughs> and who should get the credit? You ever think about that question? Who should they thank, and who should get the credit? Someone created a hospitable environment that made them feel welcome and at ease when they first came in. They stayed. It opened them up to listen. Someone organized the finances so we had a clear location to gather in and could afford it. Well, they should thank them. Someone watched their kids on Sundays so they could concentrate on the message. Someone long ago imagined 
a church existing in this community and exercise faith to establish it. Maybe they should thank them. Someone preached messages that highlighted the love of Christ that would lay down his life on the cross to offer forgiveness for their sins before God. Maybe they should thank them. Someone individually spent time with them and answered the questions and walked through life with them. Maybe they should thank them. Someone helped them imagine what they could do to make practical changes in their life and even helped resource and support them to be able to do it. Someone used their house week after week to host a life group that gave them a sense of personal belonging in the body and they felt like they were part of a family. Maybe they should thank them. The point is, our individual contributions are necessary, but never alone. (laughs) They don't have value alone, they have value together. They have value when we realize we exist as a part of an interconnected community of grace. Where through all of that service, God blesses us in ways that are evidences of his favor that we don't deserve. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of a community like that, don't you? Like, I, you know, we, we long for this in our society. Where we don't just see our lives individually as an island, but together we are able to find significance in belonging together and glorifying God and doing things that are productive that we can rejoice in. Things that are good and honest and beautiful and true. And where we're not not running over top of one another to take credit and be thanked, but we're outdoing one another and showing honor. And there's a sense of humility and the grace of God was upon them all and people were recognizing it and being saved. I mean, that's the dream biblical community empowered by the gospel rejoicing in the diversity of backgrounds and lives skills and abilities no one thinking they belong to themselves but offering themselves to God and serving one another with that vision Paul ends by highlighting and Similar ways the different functions that the Roman Christians may contribute. And and the list that's there and and what he goes through are just, they're honestly just examples. They're not an exhaustive list. He's just trying to highlight exactly what we've been highlighting this morning. The different skills, the different opportunities to serve, the different ways in which people fit themselves into the body. And encouraging them to do their part with genuine sincerity. This is what God has called us to I just want to be honest, for some of us here, we can't begin to celebrate this joyful sense of community because we've chosen to go our own way as individuals. We've gone our own way as individuals in the world apart from a sense of community with others and apart from a sense of the power of the gospel. Rejecting God, choosing our own path. In our way, we've decided to go alone. And one of the things that sin does in our lives is it convinces us that we are our own. We belong to ourselves. We don't need anyone. We can only trust ourselves. And we can chart our own path and it will be just fine. And that hasn't just applied to other people. But to God, you've applied it to God and you've disconnected from Him. And today, listen, God is calling you to something better. To humble yourself before the cross of Jesus Christ who gave up his own body on the cross to call you out of the isolation of your sin into a body that he has prepared for you. One where you can find your true calling. One where you can be reminded that your sins have been forgiven. Where you can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and fulfill what God has made you to be. And if you've been, and listen, I just want to appeal to you, if you've been out there living your own life, never understanding what it is that God is calling us to, through the grace of Jesus Christ, He's called us to leave our sin, and it's sin that isolates us from other people, keeps us from having meaningful relationships, destroys us, and separates us ultimately from God. And He's called us to turn from that sin, And trust that because Jesus' death on the cross, letting his body be broken, used for us. 
that when he was nailed to the cross, the Bible says that our sins were laid on him, that he bore the weight of them, so that in paying for our sin on the cross, you could be forgiven and free. And today, if you will turn from your sin and trust in Christ, not only will He forgive you and bring you back into a relationship with God, He'll put you in a family like this where you can be nourished by God's grace and encouraged and you can find significance to serve and walk and trust and be a part of what God wants to do to glorify Himself. And if you have never made that decision in your life, I want to beg you to consider, what are you getting right now as you're walking alone? Would you turn today and trust this good news that God has a bigger purpose and plan for you. And by faith, receive it as a gift of his undeserved favor. I'm going to ask us to bow our heads and close our eyes this morning as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. And right there where you're at, as we close and as the band comes and, and prepares to lead us in a song, I want to ask you, God appealing to you today and have you heard these words and known that God wants you today to turn from your sin and trust in Jesus to find new life in his family through what Jesus did on the cross and a real simple thing right in your seat you could respond to God knowing that's you knowing you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus right there in your seat you can say Lord I hear these words and I know you're calling to me. I've been walking alone, charting my own course apart from you. And today I want to turn around and receive what you have. Today, Lord, I offer you my life. I know I don't have much to offer you, but thank you for offering your son for me. Forgive me for my sins. Strengthen me by the power of your Holy Spirit to fulfill all that you have for me. In Jesus' name. Maybe you're here today and you've been a part of this church for a while or you just started visiting. Take a moment to reflect before we rejoice in the broken body and shed blood of Christ through the Lord's table. You know, maybe you've been li living isolated. You've sort of just chosen to drift in and out of churches. Not really connected in any vital way to community, to relationships, to serving one another. And I'm not talking about filling up our volunteer list. I'm talking about belonging. Real purpose. The power of God in our lives as we serve together and love one another. Maybe there's a barrier you need to step over today to lean in. Maybe it's all the moves that you've taken over the years that just worn you out and connecting with people. But right now, God's telling you that in this season, He's got something special if you'll lean in. And I just want to encourage you to call out to the Lord and ask Him to help you cross over those barriers and, and really lean into the circumstances that God has placed in your life for this time and for this moment. Lord, I just pray for each person across this room, Lord, that you would speak to them, that you would use these words and, and move in them by your spirit to connect us together, to organize us into a people that don't just seek to glorify you individually, but Lord, that we would help together through the power of your spirit to glorify you as a body is connected, that loves one another, that puts on display the power of how you take diverse people and make them into a unified body before you. I love you. I ask for this in Jesus' name.